So we're back with Wombat and we're going to talk about life on the boat or the carrier. So one question before we get into it, did you get a sort of trial run before you got deployed because like, you know, showing where you're going to live and anything like that. So you could be like, right, this is not for me. I'm off. <laughs> no. Uh, so the only experience I had on an aircraft carrier prior to my first deployment was um, in college, I was in uh, an ROTC program, and my just prior to my senior year of college, I did a month um, at not even at sea, but I, I went with the Kennedy. Um, they were in Mayport, and we met them. They were they were in port for two weeks, and so we kind of hung out on the base, and then they went out for one of their workups, and we went with them, and that was the first time I saw. An aircraft. I mean, that was the first time I've ever seen an aircraft carrier, other than the Intrepid in the in the New York Harbor, and uh, it was very eye opening. And then it wasn't until my first deployment I actually met the squadron. They were already on deployment, so I finished up my E two training, and they sent me directly to Australia to meet them. And so there was nothing. I had two two sea bags, and that was it. And whatever I could fit in those is what I brought, and and that was. All there was to it so you get put in a room there was absolutely zero say you know they pointed at a bunk and they're like that's your new home and i said okay that's where we're gonna stay and and it worked out so so you said sea bags there is that just standard for everyone is it a standard size or is it like your own suitcase you can bring on or i mean a lot of people bring different things and and follow on deployments you know you kind of learn things but when you're traveling you know i didn't know anything and and the funny story uh that's <laughs> looking back on it now is ridiculous, especially as an airline pilot traveling and stuff is when I finished my training in the E2 and they told me I was going to Australia, I didn't even have a passport. <laughs> like I had nothing. So, which did not go over well, by the way, because they were not happy about that. So I, I traveled from Norfolk, Virginia to, to uh, Perth, Australia, and I couldn't leave an airport. I couldn't do anything because I had no passport. I had to get behind the security lines and then stay there. I had military orders and that was it. Um, it took 48 hours to get over there. And uh, so all I brought, I, I checked, you know, the the kind of standard green military duffel bag that you throw over your shoulders. And, and that was it. I had two of those checked and I hope they made it to Australia, which they did. And then I had a backpack and that's all I brought with me for. I had no idea what to bring. And uh, you just kind of make do and do the best you can. And this would have been your time on the E2, your first cruise. First time on the E2, yeah. So it was, it was about a half or a short deployment. They were they had already started. They had done some combat operations and they were making their way uh, home. So um, I think it was a little over a month or so that I spent with them on the ship there. So it wasn't a super long time, but it was definitely a learning curve because I had no idea what to expect or, or anything. And you know, joining a squadron as the new guy when they are past the halfway point on their deployment is an interesting situation because they are ready to be home and you're just excited. You're just, you know, like, Oh my God, I'm finally doing it. Um, um, this is what I've trained for, for geez, at that point it was over three years since the beginning of flight school. And, you know, so you're, you have to almost kind of, kind of push down your ambition a little bit because, you know, it's all new, it's exciting and they're just ready to be home. You know, a lot of these guys and girls, it was their second deployment, third deployment. They were getting ready to leave the squadron and they were just, they were over it. So I learned very quickly as the new guy to keep my mouth shut and just do what I was told, get through that deployment. And then follow on deployments were a little bit different because there was more planning involved. And, and I had a little bit, a little bit more of a choice as to where I was going to live on the ship and things like that. So yeah, so let's stick with your first deployment. You mentioned there you didn't get to pick your room. So what ha what's the process? It's just like, follow me, here's your bunk, and how many people do you actually share with? So on that first uh, deployment, ironically, I stayed in the same room on the Nimitz for all three deployments I did. Oh. Um, because, and it was, that was just kind of dumb luck. Um, but my first deployment, there was a what we call the six-man room um, on the O2 level, which is one... There's one level between the flight deck and the room, which is nice because it's a little bit quieter down there. Um, we actually nicknamed the whole area Sleepy Hollow because it was just <laughs> it was easy to go down there and just get lost and, and you didn't feel like you were on an aircraft carrier. Um, but yeah, there was basically I think somebody had left the squadron and I was replacing them. So essentially I got their their room, their bunk with five other guys that had been there. Um, you know, and, and that you get you get a desk, very small desk, you get a bunk that's not big. Uh, 
and then you get two drawers and a closet and that's it and that's your world yes i can imagine that's a bit tough but how do you organize things do you, i mean do you get on each other's nerves after a while but like oh you know <laughs> stop talking or move your shit whatever how does that oh work? yeah oh yeah so definitely you know and again as a new guy and i saw this transition through my deployments but as a new guy uh very much so you know it was like hey new guy shut up go sit down that's where you're gonna be don't ask questions just just we don't want you here. Just it's just it was a rite of passage, you know, and, and it's and it and it's it's fun. And then as you go on these deployments and, you know, you start meeting friends in the squadron and you start picking who's going to be in the room and there's a hierarchy to that among the junior officers. And um, then it very much towards the end of deployments gets to the point, you know, we had guys that never or didn't never, but uh, they didn't shower as much as some of us would think <laughs> they should, uh, but they worked out a lot. We had guys that were lactose intolerant, but loved eating ice cream, you know, <laughs> things like that. And you're like, come on, man, you know, we're in this small space and you have no yeah. privacy whatsoever. Right. Um, and, you know, I mean, a, a good day in an E2 squadron was when if you were in a six man room, if one plane was going to take off with all of your roommates, you know, because that happened like one or two times in my time in the wall bangers where the two pilots and the three NFOs that were in my room with me later on went on one flight. So you'd watch them take off and you're like, oh, I finally have some privacy for six hours until they come back. You'd, you know, and it was just you'd watch TV or play video games or at the time I was actually working on my master's degree. So it gave me some some quiet time to get that done as well. Um, but, yeah, it was it was a struggle for sure. But. So a couple of points here. Um, so you crewed with guys who are on your type or your squadron mm -hmm. uh, that you bunked with, right? So was it not a better? Well, how? Did, I'm gonna try and rephrase that. So obviously, if you're flying together, but there's tension uh, where you're sleeping, you're like, and you really is boiling up. Does that affect how you fly? I don't think as much um, as you would imagine, only because, you know, there's that professional aspect to it. There's the aspect of, I mean, the ship is a dangerous place and it's trying to kill everybody. So, okay. you know, as much as we would bicker and 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 my buddy would love the hard packed ice cream and drive my other roommate nuts, you know, when it was time to go fly, it was time to go fly and, and you had to do your job. Um, and, and were there times where it did boil over or things like that in my room. Not necessarily. We had a great group of guys uh, that stayed with us basically the whole time. Um, but in other rooms, yes. And, you know, there'd be opportunity to move rooms or things like that. And sometimes the skipper would have to step in and say, OK, you guys aren't getting along. We're switching rooms. We're doing this because, you know, that's ultimately the skipper and Exo's job is to keep the squadron. You know, if there's major issues like that that are going to affect the operation, he's going to fix it, you know. But at the end of the day, we're all lieutenants are below and you know you deal with it the way you deal with it and sometimes it's a nice way and sometimes it's not a nice way and you just kind of you know it's, yeah. it's just it's like being in any locker room or anything like that you know where sometimes the guy that uh doesn't shower enough needs to be explained that he needs to shower more and things like that you know <laughs> so we would take a bag of his clothes and throw it in the shower and then you know something like that just yeah, di yeah. different things like that so yeah um but yeah, you, you learn to live with people. I'll tell you, um, you, you create amazingly strong bonds. Um, the, uh, I've said it before, but in, in treason flight, uh, the character of Clipper is one of my really good friends. Um, he is a real person. People don't believe that they think I made him up, but, uh, and, um, I mean, he and I were roommates on all those deployments. So uh, we've been close for over 20 years now, and it's just a bond that I know if I called him right now and said I needed his help, even though he lives across the country, he'd be on a plane awesome. to come help me. I mean, that's just so. So while it's frustrating at times, it creates these bonds that are just unbelievable um, for life, which is pretty cool. That is cool, yeah. So what were the facilities like on board, like, you know, um, food, entertainment, exercise, stuff like that? So uh, for the officers, so they kind of split it on a carrier. You know, you have the uh, the mess decks for the enlisted and then the wardrooms for the officers. There was various wardrooms, um, both on on all Nimitz class carriers, um, you know, and, and it really depended. It was interesting in my transition from E2s to, to Hornets because we would be when we moved to the Stennis and I moved to the Hornet squadron, we were in a different ready room. 
And it's funny because you would eat kind of where your ready room was because that's where you hung out all day. That was your right. office. If you weren't flying, you were either in your room or in the ready room. And um, in the E2 squadron, we were in ready room two, which is way up forward. Uh, so we would always eat in the forward uh, wardroom. And it was just nice. It was quiet up there, you know. And then in my Hornet squadron, we were in towards the back of the ship. So we would eat downstairs, um, which was a more formal wardroom. It was funny. That's where more of the higher ranking ships personnel would come. Oh, and I always liked, we, we kind of referred to the forward wardroom as the dirty shirt, you know, that's kind of where the working guys go. And I liked eating up there because it was yeah. just, there was just less of the formalities of things. Yeah. You know, I, I remember the first time I went down to the, to the uh, wardroom below in the, in the middle of the ship. And I just walked up to a table. I knew some guys at and sat down and like, they all gave me these looks and I'm like, Okay. And like afterwards, one of my buddies is like, dude, did you see who was at the table? You're supposed to request permission to sit here. And I'm oh, like, Christ. get the hell out of here. Like, <laughs> I'm like, we don't do that up forward, man. Like we just sit down. Like, and he's oh. like, well, yeah, I was like, ah, whatever. You know, it's not the first person I'm pissed off. It's not gonna be the last, but, um, so it was just a different vibe, you know, as far as eating goes, you know, sometimes I would go down. Um, I tried to leave my guys and girls alone when I was a division officer, cause that was their time to eat. I didn't want to, you know, be the officer that's, that's in there. But sometimes, you know, they'd invite me to be like, Hey, sir, you want to come down to the mess decks? And I'm like, hell yeah, I do. That'd be fun. You know, and you get the whole shop together and you'd when eat. you get invited. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Cause again, it's their personal space. Um, you know, so the food was good. It was funny on the Nimitz. The food was actually award winningly good. Like they, um, and that was, I know you've watched the interviews with nasty Manazer and that was all his time. And, and he put people in the position that, I mean, it was winning awards for how good the food was. And I didn't appreciate that until I moved on to the Stennis and I started eating there and I'm like, guys, this food kind of sucks. <laughs> you know, you, you miss it. Um, so it really kind of varied how good the food was based on the ship. And, and you were always, you were always skeptical if the food was really good all of a sudden, because that usually meant they were about to give you bad news. So, like, oh, if right. they're breaking out, like, hey, it's steak dinner, you're like, oh, boy, like, like, what's are we extending yeah. on deployment? <laughs> like, that's not good, you know. Um, so you had that. That was kind of where we would eat. And then as far as exercise, there was some there was multiple gyms on the ship um, for whatever you wanted to do. <clears throat> they were typically pretty crowded, so you'd find times to go. Um, one of the things, and they had other, other exercise equipment like rowing machines or stationary bikes kind of placed all throughout. And when I was on the Nimitz, one of the things I liked is right outside my room, you would basically go out, I'll still remember it. It's been forever. Go out, make a right, a left. And there was a ladder well to go up to where the ready room was. Well, in that ladder well, there was a stationary bike just sitting there. Oh, and I, I kind of, the joke became on my second and third deployment is I was trying to ride the bike home because I was on it all the time. Like <laughs> if I had been up on the platform all day as an LSO and it's one in the morning, you know, I would switch out of my flight suit and go hop and ride on the bike for an hour just to kind of, you know, listen to music and not be on an aircraft carrier. You know, that was my escape. Um, so you kind of had to figure out what was there. Um, but there was really good facilities. You know, obviously the, the military wants you to stay in shape, you know, to the best that you can. Um, but I never really got in. Some guys got into running. I never got into running. I'm not a runner, but also on the ship, it's your options are to run on the flight deck when we're not flying, which is really hard on your joints because it's a steel flight deck yeah. or run on a treadmill, which is really hard on your whole body because the ship's moving. And I've watched people in the gym just completely eat it when they're trying to run on a treadmill. And I'm like, wow. I'll just stick to the bike or the rower. Yeah, I'll give that a miss. Something simple, you know, yeah. <laughs> but there was good facilities for that. You know, the joke was. The movie theater, the bowling alley, all those things which don't exist. I hate to dispel that myth, but mm. that's how you would mess with new guys. You know, you'd tell them to meet down at the bowling alley, you know, after dinner or something. And they'd be walking all over the ship trying to find it and stuff like that. So, um, you know, but all in all, it's it's a floating city. So anything you could possibly want, barber shops, ship store, all that stuff was there. Because it had to be, you know, because you're gone for so long and you don't know. I mean, we went 90 days once without pulling into a port. So, wow, wow. you know, you got to <laughs> you got to have facilities there to be able to do stuff and, and all that. So and I've always wanted to know one. But so, you know, you if you're let's say I, I don't know if you're on duty at a certain time period, but you're walking through the ship and you pass people, you have no idea. Do you have to do they have to respect you and you respect them? Say, you know, like, sir, or anything like that. Does that happen? 
Yeah. So, so there's really no saluting because it's considered indoors. Right. And we don't, right. you know, I mean, one of the things, in, at least in the Navy is as soon as you get on the ship, you take your, your cover, your hat and you throw it in a drawer because you're not going to wear it again. Right. Um, I mean, on a six month deployment, the only time I wore a hat is when I got in trouble and had to go talk to the skipper of the ship on the bridge because <laughs> they wear hats up there. So you'd have to go find it. Right. Um, but yeah, typically there was a little bit of a hierarchy there, uh, walking through the passageways, you know, every, every so many frames, there's what we call a knee knocker, which is, you know, the, the, where you'd step through yeah, yeah. and those were the waterproof doors, you know, that if there was ever battle damage, they could close. So you're constantly stepping through those. You're constantly going back and forth, you know, as somebody's coming the other way, usually, um, it kind of deferred to rank, right. You know, so if it's somebody higher ranking, you'd let them come through vice versa, um, but it was, you know, it's, it's sometimes you're just so cued in or you're not paying attention and you end up cutting off, you know, somebody pretty high rank and, and then you apologize. You know, so it's there's certain etiquette like that that you pick up on very quickly if you just keep your eyes open. You know what I mean? And just yeah. kind of watch. And that was probably the best advice I got um, from a guy who unfortunately uh, passed away in an E2. But he told me on day one, he's like, hey, he was a backseater um, gazer. He was an awesome NFO. And uh he told me uh, we were we met in Australia on that port call when I met the squadron. And he goes, the best piece of advice I could give you is enjoy it, but keep your mouth shut and your eyes open for this time. And you'll learn so much. And he was right. I mean, I really did. It was those little nuances you pick up where you just instead of trying to show everybody who you are, you just kind of shut up and just watch and you learn so much. And then and then it becomes second nature. You know, it's just being on the boat. That's how it is. So, yeah, absolutely. So we, we have to talk about how do you contact uh, friends and family? Because obviously there was probably not internet back in those days. No offense there, one back, but how did you get the you know contact? Be like, hi, your mom, hi, your dad, anything like that? So we did. Uh, we did have internet. Um, it was never fast. It was never really good. And it was internet that's controlled by the ship, right? So if anything was going on whatsoever, it could be one switch shuts the whole internet down. And if anything oh, happened... Wow. Um, Basically, uh, I don't want to say mishap wise, but if we were doing certain drills, um, if we were if some if an accident did happen of any sort, um, if we were doing a man overboard drill or a real man overboard because somebody, you know, was suspected or seen falling off the ship, they would immediately shut the Internet down. Now, there were certain people on the ship, obviously, that are high ranking enough that they would yeah. still have Internet. But for us, it was immediate, you know, and you'd be sitting there in the middle of typing an email home. And you'd see the little icon pop up that the internet's no. down and you're just like, yeah. all right, you know, but it was never fast. I'm sure it's better now. I hope it's better now for the people that are deployed. Um, so that was primarily what you would do is a lot of email once you got it set up. Um, and then there was also phones, um, ship phones that, uh, that you could call on. They would sell you calling cards. And I still remember, um, <laughs> you know, I would go up into the, the forward ward room and, I'd have my calling card and I'd dial through all this and you couldn't say anything. There was somebody always listening in. So if you said anything, you would immediately lose wow, the really? connection. Yeah. But, you know, so we had code words back to family where you'd give them a list of code words before you left and you would have it and you'd be able to kind of communicate without giving oh, away yeah. where you're at or things like that. Um, but I remember still to this day, which is insane. It was a dollar a minute to talk on that calling card. Wow. Yeah. So you'd buy a, a $20. But I mean, the other side of it, you know, and guys would complain about that, but it's like, what else am I spending my money on? You know, I'm out yeah, here exactly. on a ship for six months, most of which were in a combat zone. So it's tax free money. It's like, I'll go buy another calling card and call my mom. You know, she'll love it. So um, my mom always got a kick, I think, out of that, you know, hearing the phone call from the ship. And, um, you know, and that's pretty much what you had until you pulled into port. Um, and that whole progression changed throughout my career, too. I, I remember. My first deployment, you pull into port, it was still calling cards, right? By my last deployment in the Hornet, I mean, a guy, guys would buy cell phones and then whatever port they'd pull into, they would just buy a new SIM card and put yeah. it in and can talk anywhere. And I'm like, this is so much easier now. You know, it was, so it's the technology has made it uh, a lot easier, but it's still you're you're disconnected. And I think that's why you become so close to the people you're deployed with, because that's your family ultimately. Um through thick and thin, whatever's going on, the people around you are the ones that, that have your back. So, um, so that was it, you know, that's how you, you talk to people for a long time. So, 
Yeah, absolutely. Took some getting used to. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. And you mentioned there you go and buy a call card. Was it like um, you call probably call them stores where you can go and pick up a Twix or anything like mm -hmm. that? Was there stuff like that on board? Yeah, so you would go down there and, um, you know, obviously they sold like some of the ship memorabilia, you know, the ball caps and the hats and things yeah. like that. But then it was pretty much like a small convenience store where if you needed shaving cream, if you needed a calling card, if you just wanted a candy bar or an energy drink or something, you could buy all that. And, you know, initially my first deployment, it was all cash. Um, but then it became where basically you would have a ship's uh, credit card, essentially, and you would load yeah. it up with money and then yep. you just buy whatever you needed and you know they had cigars down there they had all sorts of stuff that you know you just kind of whatever little treat that you were going to do you know sometimes we would do movie nights in the ready room and you know we'd send a couple guys down there to just buy out the store and just bring up snacks and all that or you know we we'd have the enlisted uh shops come up to to watch movies in the ready room sometimes oh, and cool. same thing you know we would we'd buy out the store and, and, you know, uh, with chips and, and snacks, or sometimes we'd go even further and kind of schmooze the chefs to, to cook us something nice for it, you know, or they'd make us pizza or they'd make us like a meal oh, really? for all the shops, you know? So it was, it was something to do. Um, because essentially when you deploy, I mean, if you think about it, you're at work 24 hours a day yeah. until you pull into port. And then even in port, you're still doing work. It's not like everybody just, takes off and has a good time, you know, there's duty you have to do and watch schedules. So, you know, you would do whatever you could to make their day, everybody's day just a little better. Um, and I think that's what really made a deployment either successful or not is if everybody was willing to just put in that, that extra five or 10% to make the people around them happier, then it was, you know, it, it multiplied and it really made the deployment better. So, yeah, absolutely. And did you ever mix with like, let's say, um, either with the E2 or your Hornet deployments, with like the Tomcat crews or the A7 guys or whatever, do you ever say like, oh, let's just all get together, you know, watch a movie or did that ever happen or? Sure. So um, I think in the E2 squadron, it was a little bit tougher because you have so many air crew that if you were yeah. running a movie night, you know, you would, uh, you would, you would fill up the ready room, right? Um, but when it came to the Hornet squadron, you know, we had a lot less air crew. Um, so we would get together with the other Hornet squadrons or as an LSO, you know, you'd be walking through and and uh, giving out the, the landing grades for the night. And, you know, if a squadron happened to be playing a good movie, you know, they'd be like, hey, come on back. So you'd go back there and hang out with them. So it definitely wasn't, you know, autonomous where you just stayed with your squadron. It was it was all kind of mixed together. Um, we all kind of lived together. We would have our own rooms. So typically squadrons would get x number of rooms for the squadron so you wouldn't typically have roommates in your room that flew a different aircraft but right. the people right next door to you might be the prowler squadron or the hornet squadron or whatever so you kind of all lived in the same area you got to know each other mm -hmm. um i think as an e2 guy being an lso was probably the best to really get to meet people in the air wing um just because as a pilot we weren't as engaged in the mission planning and things like that but then when once i moved to the hornet you know you would fly mixed sections with the other squadrons and things like that so you were constantly working together it was just kind of one big family at that point um yeah. for good or for bad <laughs> yeah of course and inevitably there'll probably be conflicts there like how did that get settled where two guys or two girls or whatever just really didn't get on and they almost like you bumped heads how does that how does that happen because i think i interviewed I can't remember. Um, uh, Mike Vizcara, and he said there's like a little jail on board. And I was like, what? I, I oh, was yeah. surprised so, about that. Yeah, so there's a brig. Um, and, and I mean, if it got really bad, you'd go to the brig. And the brig is, I mean, I went down there for a tour once, and it was very eye-opening that I never wanted to be in the brig. Um, you know, in the Navy, it's absolutely possible that if you got sent to the brig, you could be put on bread and water. No kidding. Yeah, that was it, and yeah. Um, and I mean, from every story I've heard that just messes up your body and your intestines so bad that I was like, Nope, I don't One, it was so far down in the ship. I always tried to stay as close to the flight deck as possible. I figured that yeah. was my escape. <laughs> yeah. Um, but for the most part, at least on the officer side, um, you know, we're all adults, we're all officers, you know, you would either you know, if it was done correctly, you would you would talk it out, yell it out, whatever. But if it was done in a situation where, you know, then people get petty and it's 
Yeah. It's, you know, in a way it's no different than high school. You know, you would hang out oh. with certain cliques of people and things like that. And, uh, there was always rumors and stuff like that. Cause I mean, that's just life at, at sea. Um, on the, on this enlisted side, you know, there were times where, where guys or girls in my shop would get into fights and things like that. And, you know, the, the people around them would separate them and, you know, and hopefully cooler heads would prevail. And if it was really bad, then there were official channels, you know, where potentially you could lose your rank and things like that. And, you know, you always hoped it never got to that. And, and for the most part in the shops I ran, uh, cause I leaned so heavily on the senior enlisted cause I knew they knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Um, I did not need to, to show them that I knew better because frankly I didn't. And, uh, I think that helped a lot, you know, to show that little bit of humility and just like, hey, we're all here to try to work together. And, um, you know, for the most part, you know, it's not easy every day, but, you know, overall, on the average, we get through it. We get everybody home safe. Uh, you know, we live to fight another day type of thing. Absolutely. So to wrap up uh, before we talk about your new book, uh, what would you say the pros and cons of living on the on the boat were? I think the biggest con would just be your personal space. Um, it, it truly is. I mean, guys got really good, especially if you're in an eight man or a six man room, you know, your bunk became your whole world and, uh, guys got really good at, you know, duct taping all the curtains. So like it was completely sealed and you would have pictures of your family and things like that. Um, so that was probably the biggest con is just, you know, you're, you're not, that's all you have. It, it's such a small space. And then like I said, as soon as you step out of that bunk, it's you're at work, you know, constantly and, and um, your actions are being judged as they should. And you have to act a certain way. Um, but the biggest pro of that is everybody's there. So when it's time to come together, um, whether it's an aircraft emergency, whether it's a, a, a combat mission or something like that, you know, everybody so well and you work together. The, the synergy of everything is so good that it's it truly is lethal i mean you could fly off the wing of somebody and almost know what they're thinking before they do it and and yeah. i think that is something that um is unique to naval aviation just because you're you're stuck in this space for so long and when that air wing and that ship finally gel together as one it is just it's a lethal fighting force that i you know i i don't know if you can replicate in a different world for the mission that it does so those are kind of the the sides of it that i think are are the pros and cons but you know it's, it's been a while too so you know now i look back at it and i'm like yeah it wasn't that bad but in the moment i'm like <laughs> i just want to get off this thing you yeah know? of so, course yeah hindsight's always great isn't it exactly exactly <laughs> But uh, yeah, Wombat, let's talk about your new book, uh, Vengeance Flight. It's been recently re released and it's doing great. So tell us about the new book, where the idea come from, and also how long it took to write. So uh, kind of the natural progression from Treason Flight, right? So Rattler uh, went through, not to give away too much Treason Flight, but went through his whole time, lots of ups and downs. Um, but then at the end gets an opportunity to transition F-18s. Uh, so now Vengeance Flight picks up from there and everything seems like it's going to be good and, uh, and and everything from his past kind of in his mind is is gone and he's overcome it and he's moving forward with his lifelong dream. Unfortunately, the powers that be uh, have different plans. So he's thrust back into an even uh, more immersed world of what he dealt with in the first book and, and lots of twists and turns. Um so it took about, well, unfortunately, it took about two years from when Treason Flight came out to when Vengeance Flight came out. Um, and some of that was because, I'll be honest with you, I wasn't 100% sure if I was going to. I had the idea for a second book, but I was like, Man, do I want to go through all this again? Yeah. Because uh, it is tedious. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and there's highs and lows. You know, your first book comes out. Some people are like, this thing's great. Other people are like, who is this guy? This is horrible. And you're, you're like, I'm just trying to learn, you know, and do the best I can. And um, But eventually started writing it. And then it kind of took off in my mind and then I was really excited about it. And then it fought me every step of the way from there, from, um, you know, the editing went fine. The cover, there was some hiccups with the cover uh, where I was going to go one direction and it changed. And I think the cover actually came out pretty good. I've gotten some really positive feedback yeah, on that. Um, and then the biggest hiccup that anybody that follows me knows is yeah. the Department of Defense just... I mean, it really wasn't the Department of Defense. Um, it was more the Navy. 
uh, just shut it down and, and, and lost it a couple times. Right. Um, so to put it in perspective, you know, we've, we've spoken about this, but I like to get all my stuff cleared just for my own protection. Yeah. Um, it also, I've learned gives, if anybody were to ever want to screenplay it or move it to that level, it's an extra level of protection for them as well. So, um, you know, so it's, to me, it's worth the work. I don't want to ever, uh, jeopardize anything with my family and my personal life for something Absolutely. I wrote. So, um, treason flight took about a month. It was like, I just looked the other day. It took just over four weeks from the time I submitted it to the DOD to the time they gave it back to me and said, it's cleared as amended, change these three terms done. So I changed them, sent it out. So, with vengeance flight, I'm like, okay, you know, I'll give it more time. I'll plan on, on, you know, three months, right. Three times as long as treat. I don't know. You know, it's kind of a, a crap shoot. And they had it for over five months. Um, and I was back and forth. The guy at the DOD was fantastic. I can't say enough good things about him. He stayed in communication. Um, but I mean, it was just, it was getting held up at the Navy and, and, you know, when people read it, there's nothing in there. First of all, I would never write anything that ever jeopardized any secret, but the topic it's like, there's nothing in there, but for whatever, somebody got a hold of it or some department got a hold of it and maybe didn't like it. So they slowed it down. They lost it, all this stuff. Well, finally the DOD told them like, you have until this date to prove that there's something that can't be published in there or else it's getting cleared and the Navy never replied. So they wow. basically cleared it. And, um, so it's out and <laughs> I don't know if it's going to make people, you know, I, I think I've had some people, um, come to me and say, well, you know, the reason why they delayed it is because the Navy's not presented in the best light in the book. And I go, well, I disagree because while there are some aspects of the Navy that are not presented in the best light, there are other aspects of the Navy that show how great it really is. So it's really your own personal look on, you know, if you focus on the negative, sure, you could say like, hey, the Navy kind of comes across looking a little little bad in this. But if you look at it, if you take a step back and look at the big thing, it shows you truly, in my mind, the, the both ends of the pendulum on – the military and how really our military and I'm sure every country's military is just a cross section of their society. Yeah. And with that, you have some of the greatest examples of leadership and some of the worst all put into one organization. So, um, so it's been interesting, but, uh, I think, you know, ultimately the biggest hang up was the initial, I didn't know if I wanted to do it. And then towards the end, it was very frustrating. And I appreciate all the support of everybody because I had to delay it. You know, I think it was five or six weeks from did, when I was yeah. going to publish it, which really broke my heart because I mean, people are pre-ordering it. They're, they're, they're spending their hard earned money. They're excited about it. And you know, they're just getting these updates. So I'm happy it's out. Um, it's out now on paperback and ebook. And I'm, I've already submitted the hardcover finally, cause that got delayed as well. Um, that should pop up on, you know, anywhere you can buy hardcovers here shortly. Um, Literally on Amazon, it shows that there's a hardcover, but it's out of stock. So that's usually what happens right prior to it showing up for sale. Um, and then I'm working on the audiobook edits right now. As soon as I get off this, I'll be listening to more chapters. Um, Mike Dawson's doing the audiobook again, the one who did Treason Flight. Um, and uh, we'll have that out here shortly as well. So it's out there. <laughs> Yeah, and who did the front cover? Because uh, that's absolutely amazing. I mean, it really does pop and stand out. So there's a company um, that's called Ebook Launch, and they do, you know, you can, you basically, there's there's a couple different ways you can do it. And Treason Flight and Vengeance Flight were very different approaches. They did both covers. Um, on Treason Flight, I told them, here's some book covers I really liked. Um, and I primarily told them Flight of the Intruder. I love the Flight of the Intruder yeah. with the A6 launching off the ship. Um, and then I gave them some other pictures and they kind of pieced it all together and came up with treason flight, which I think is an interesting cover with the E2 launching and all that. Now we had to do some tweaks because the first carrier they put on, it was a Russian carrier with a A10 warthog on the flight deck. So it was just file, <laughs> file footage yeah. that I'm like that. I can't yeah. let that go because somebody's no. going to call me out. So we got all that with vengeance flight. I had a vision for what I wanted. I wanted the main character to be the focus of this, um, and I had some ideas and it's funny because I have pictures of um, kind of the, the lead up to this where I wanted, 
you to see the character's eyes and they were super blue eyes and all this. Um, but eventually I was like, you know what? I don't like that. So working with them, we created this cover and, you know, it, it shows aspects of the whole book with, with Rattler, the main character. Um, but then also the, you know, you see the Hornet, you see an A10 or I'm sorry, an OV10 Bronco. Um, even if you look deep into the radar hits, the call signs, are the call signs in the book, which I oh, thought wow. was a really cool touch they did. Little um, a little bit, yeah. So it was really kind of neat. You know, I pay homage to the E2 because Cyclops is the E2's call sign in there, and that's right there on the cover. So I'll never let go of that. Um, but what I thought was very interesting afterwards, and this was a byproduct of not even doing this, is when you read both of these books, the character changes quite a bit. And somebody had mentioned to me, like, the covers next to each other look like fire and ice, you know, because it's all blue and kind of innocent and friendly on Trees and Plight, but then Vengeance Flight is all red and dark and all that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's funny because that goes along with the story, which is very interesting. So, yeah, uh, like I said, ebook launch, they did the editing, they did the, the cover for both. I can't say enough good things about that company. They really, I mean, anybody who's looking to do artwork like that or editing, they're fantastic. They really are. So, I, and I defer to the experts when it comes like that. Just like Mike Dawson with the with the audiobook, I'm not an audiobook guy. He is. I defer to the experts. That's just the best way to do it. So absolutely, yeah. So you said they're working on the audiobook. So when can we expect that to come out? So I've got literally 39 chapters of it sitting here on my desktop that I have to listen to. I've gotten through about half of those, um, and then he's got the last probably third of the book coming to me shortly. Right. Um, I'll send back the edits, which are very few edits, actually. He does such a fantastic job, just the way he reads it. Um, you know, most of the edits at this point are just jargon that if you weren't in the military or specifically the Navy, you might not know yes. um, how it's spoken. Um, so he'll go back through, he'll edit those, and then we'll have the final one up. So I'm, I'm hoping uh, probably, you know, optimistically would be the end of this month, but realistically, I'm hoping in July it'll be out there. Um, and I think it'll be worth it. Uh, I, I still get chills if I listen to Treason Flight with his voice. Like he just, yeah. he, he 100% uh, knocks it out of the park. And, you know, he was excited about this book. And, and he, you know, when he finished reading it through the first time, he called me and it was like, I think it was like 11 o'clock at night, my time, and woke me up. And he's like, we have to talk. This is amazing, the story. And I was like, oh, you know, so it's cool to have that connection with him. And, um, and like I said, he's in my mind, he's the best. I mean, he's Rattler a hundred percent the way he reads it. So I like it. Uh, so I think it's worth it. So brilliant stuff. So we'll keep an eye out for that. But, uh, yeah, obviously you said, uh, your books are on Amazon, but also you have a website and social media. So you can just tell our viewers where we can find you one path. Sure. So the easiest thing, and, and I, I'm shocked by this, but if you just Google TR Matson or Google Wombat, I'm the first pop up. But the website is uh, trmatson.com, and that's got links to everything. So you could see uh, old writing I've done in articles. You could see, you know, purchase any of the books. I put the prologues of both books up there. So if you want to read a sample, um, just so you can have it. And then there's links to to everything, including some merchandise if people want that. I'm not a huge merchandise guy, but there's some cool things if people want it, you know. Um, and uh, but everything's right there, and then that links to all the social media stuff. But essentially, it's you know Tr Matson. If you Google that, you'll see Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff that's out there. So brilliant stuff, and we'll link all that in the description below. But I appreciate uh, it. congrats on the new release, and yeah, thank, thank you, you very much for coming on the show again, Wamba. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's been too long. We need to do it more often. I enjoy Absolutely. talking. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Matt. See you.